Okay, I think this will be fine. I'll try not to be too belligerent. You can, you can be as belligerent <laughs> as you want, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, you're speaking to people. A lot of them know you. Uh, Ed Harris, no, Ed, 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 Ed Harris told me that, uh, as a matter of fact, you're quite well known in Europe. Well, people tell me that, but of course I have no assurance of that at all. I, I have sold records there, and uh, and uh, and uh, Oliver Daniel tells me that uh, I am, but I don't know personally. Why don't we start with tonight? Tonight we've just seen a dress rehearsal of Harry Parch's opera. Excuse me, you don't particularly care for the word opera, no, do you? No, opera, uh, opera denotes, in, in my mind, a, an Italian thing or, a, or at least a European thing. This is not European in any sense that I understand it, even though I would not be opposed to being, uh, to being uh, uh, put beside Mussorgsky, for example, at all. But it's still, it's still very different from Mussorgsky because... Uh, because it involves musicians on stage. That is the big difference. And the musicians are actors. They're in costume. They've got painted bellies, for example. And uh, Muskarski, Muskarski didn't paint his musicians' bellies. <laughs> no. All right, so then it's, it's not an opera, but to use your own I term. I call it a show. I call it a show. And, and, and this is the only word I can come to, up with. Somebody in New York called it an extravaganza. This was not this work, because this has never been done before. Extravaganza. You're, she, uh, this woman, this is Peggy Glendale Hicks, a composer. She said, what shall I call this? Uh, all I can say is an extravaganza. <laughs> well, I've heard uh, that you like to call it occasionally a music drama. That's right, or a dance drama. This one is a music drama, certainly. Well, the title is Delusion of the Fury. Mm -hmm. And it is based on folk tales from Japan and from Africa. Yeah, right. Now, I would like to ask you uh, about the Oriental and African influence on your music, on your oh, composition. It's, it's, it's been very great. It's been very great. Uh, in fact, everything. I don't know where I belong. Somebody else is going to have to decide this because I can't decide it because I grew up with Christian hymns, I grew up with Yaki Indian chants, uh, I, and, and uh, Chinese lullabies because my parents had been missionaries and they became apostate and they left and uh, uh, many other influences. Hebrew, Hebrew uh, chants for the dead, which I experienced very early in my life. And so, where do I belong? I don't know. And, and Anyway, in this case, a great many people have said, uh, have said uh, that my work is um, Indonesian, because th th there's a great deal of percussion. Well, there certainly is an Asian sound to it, and uh, to anyone accustomed to it, there's uh, some echoes of a gamelan orchestra, yeah. but it's entirely different. It's uh, strictly Harry Parch. No person who knows gamelan would call it gamelan. <laughs> This, is, this has been my experience all through my life. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Anglo-Saxons, or let's say people in this country, call it Asian or call it Oriental. I have never known an Oriental who calls it Oriental. <laughs> well, I, I guess people do look for a frame of reference exactly. because the music certainly is different. And as I said, it's pure Harry Parch. And one of the reasons, of course, is that... Uh, as it's been uh, described to me, you've taken the regular octave, which on the piano keyboard has 12 intervals, and broken it down, or perhaps we should say refined it, or built it up, if you wish, into 43 intervals in that one octave. Well, this is very ancient. It's very ancient. Uh, the idea of, uh, of microtones is about as ancient as you can get. It's not my idea. And by the way, it's not 43. Uh, I have 43 on my instruments of fixed pitch, but actually I don't limit myself to anything, nothing whatever. You, you mean you do use more than 43? Oh, indeed I do. And in fact, even on the instruments of fixed pitch, I have reeds, and uh, one of the 
musicians on the Chromalodium has a has a little jar, and he has to put in another reed <laughs> at a certain place in order to get another pitch, and so it, it isn't 43. Although, you know, this this is this becomes a number that so somewhat somewhat magical. I don't know. I suppose I'm responsible for it, really, but I reject it. Right now, I reject it because it isn't true. Now, can the average person distinguish 43 tones, 43 intervals? Well, you see, now we get into uh, Bell Laboratories and uh, Seashore Acoustics at the University of Iowa. Uh, indeed they can, indeed they can. Uh, according, according to Bell Laboratories, there I, I, as I recall, and this is from memory, as I recall, this the octave above middle C to the next octave above middle C, the average ear can distinguish 600 different pitches. And I think the second important thing we should mention is that Mr. Parch creates his own instruments. How long have you been, uh, shall we call, not only a musical innovator, but a designer of musical instruments? Well, a long time, a lot of decades. Um, I grew up in, with a, a father who had a wood shop, and he taught me how to use tools when I was about five years old, as I recall. Therefore, it wasn't any big trick to go from music, which was my interest, right, right away, right away. In fact, I never had, I, I see so many college kids today, and, and they, they don't know what they're doing. I mean, they don't know what they want to be let's say, a doctor, a lawyer, or whatever. And, uh, and I'm not putting them down at all. I think, it, I think it's very sad that they don't know what they want to be. And I have every, uh, all the compassion in the world about this. But to me, there was never any doubt. I always, I was involved with music, one way or another. But I found very early that I didn't like it the way it was. And so I began to work on it. And that was when I was about 14. Well, how long have you been composing? Since I was 14. <laughs> but I had no instruments of my own then. And uh, I began experimenting, because it's, it's, it's got to start this way. You, you start with what you've got, it's what the world gives you. After all, you start with your own body, for example. That's what the world gives you. And uh, I, I started with what I had, and I began, I found very quickly that I couldn't, could do nothing with a piano. It was static, you know, it was fixed. Uh, and uh, so I began working with violins and violas. And then my first instrument was the viola, my adopted viola, which is not used in this work. But I played it myself. And then uh, my next experiments with it were, were with keyboards. And I built several keyboards, uh, experimental keyboards, which I never finished. I, well, one of them was finished, uh, but uh, it was impractical. I, there was certainly not enough money to, to get, do it right. And uh, well, after that, I, well, with guitar, that's another one that I experimented with. And I gave up on uh, guitar uh, because, uh, no, I didn't really give up, except with this, with this, uh, plastic rod that I have, because then you can do it by ear, you see. You can't do it by ear uh, if you have frets, it, or you can to some extent, because of course good guitar players can move the string on the fret and get different tones. But um, Well, I was going to say that uh, you started composing at the age of 14, yeah. but 1930, when you were 28, was sort of a turning point for you. Uh, 19, yes, 1930, that's right, that's right. How did you know this? <laughs> I read a little. <laughs> I burned everything I'd written. You, you really destroyed all the compositions you've been working on? Everything, everything. I had, uh, what did I have? I had about 50 songs, I had a string quartet, a symphonic poem, a piano concerto. Uh, yes, I destroyed everything. But the, the, the this amazing part is that I destroyed nothing because it's all up here. <laughs> it really is. And it, amazingly enough, I keep, not in this work, not in this work. I, I didn't go back in this work at all. 
but in much of my previous work, I pulled out of that. Then for the creator, for the artist, nothing is lost. Everything is a building process, building on the past, on what you had done before. Oh, indeed, indeed, indeed. It's, it's like the, somewhat like the Frenchman who did a big mural on a mirror for some woman in London, and the bombs came down during the war, and the thing was destroyed, and she said, oh, uh, the, uh, your, your, your work is destroyed. And he said, he came and looked at it, and he put it back together, and he said, no, now it's complete, <laughs> because it was so much more beautiful, broken. Well, you see, I, th this is not really a parallel. This is not really a parallel. Everything is fragile. Life is fragile. Instruments are fragile. I know this, and uh, I don't expect it to be any other way. Well, certainly some things do endure. Well, in music, you see, music is a quite a different, different uh, thing than, than art, where, where, where uh, you have almost complete freedom in the sense that you can that one can uh, uh, put things together, all kinds of things together, like pop art. You don't have to. You don't have to have a capital investment, a real capital investment, before you buy paints and brushes. But you do in music, and therefore, the 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 uh, corpus of knowledge and literature and so forth that goes into music is much more laggard. In, in the sense of following some path. Now you see the, the chance people, the electronics people, they're, they're throwing this all overboard. Well, I'm against it, I'm against it. I do not throw overboard everything that's happened. I seem to. In fact, I was doing this uh, 30 years ago, or, or maybe 40 years ago. What is this, 1969? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it does go, but you know, you mentioned uh, electronic music, and uh, I think to the uninitiated, there is a, a certain resemblance in the way you use pitch and the way you use tone to the electronics, except that something is added, or rather something has not been taken away, and that's the human element of the performer. Exactly, the corporeality. That is what is so important to me, and this is why I simply, even though I like some electronic music very much, I simply cannot go along with sitting in a, an auditorium and looking at a speaker. Now, if, if there's a film involved with it, that's a quite a different thing. But getting back to uh, the influences, uh, you mentioned all sorts of musical influences. What about the older established classical composers. Like who? All right, we'll, Beethoven. Me we'll mention Beethoven. Okay. When anyone denounces Beethoven, I'm the first guy to defend him. <laughs> Does that answer it? <laughs> well, I, well that, that's, that's fine. Would, would, you, would you be annoyed if we uh, found a similarity in your music to that of uh, Bach's because of uh, the mathematical precision? Uh, well, when you say mathematical, Bach wasn't mathematical. You, know, you see, you're talking about the fugal form, the contrapuntal form. And sure, there was a certain kind of mathematics there. Or, or let's say there was a pattern there. But it had nothing whatever to do with acoustics. Nothing. And mine does have something to do with it. Now, this is, I'm not putting down Bach. I'm not deprecating him at all. But, uh, but it's totally different. And, and he came at a time in history when musicians were demanding some simplicity. Because here, here's the problem, you see. Uh, as I said, there, there was a corpus of literature and of knowledge about literature and about instruments and about people taking care of instruments, which is fantastically important, uh, you know, which, which I don't have with my instruments. I have to do it myself. And, uh, and, uh, well, uh, this is totally different. It's just totally different. He was fulfilling a need at that time, a need for, in a, in a sense, simplicity. And he, he did it very well. I can't put myself in that time and, and, uh, and compare myself at all. And 
uh, see, it's, it's, it's like Bach. I, I would like to go back a little farther, really. Uh, go back to Monteverdi and uh, Perry and the Renaissance and, uh, and say that uh, this is not my beginning either. In fact, I have to go back to the African jungle and, and, and uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Chinese classics and India, although India is uh, so complex that I can't bring myself into that at all. But, uh, well, so is the African jungle. Well, I, how, can I, how can I pursue this except you, you've got to lead me. <laughs> okay, then uh, why don't we stop here a moment and go out and take a look at the instruments that you designed. Right. Mr. Parch, now that we've uh, had a chance to look at and to hear the instruments that you designed and which play such an integral part in your music drama, The Delusion of the Fury, I think I would like to ask you what your definition of music is. I would preface this by saying that uh, at first I was going to say the music that I heard tonight was out of this world, otherworldly. But in a way it isn't because these are very much the sounds I've been accustomed to hearing, but tonight in a different way. I don't know how to answer that. I, this, is, this comment has been made many times. Uh, that uh, they expect it to be dissonant, for example, uh, twelve tone, for example, which I have nothing to do with. Uh, I am very concerned with consonants, tremendously concerned with consonants, which is probably why you say uh, that uh, it isn't too far out for you. Or, or I'm, I'm not sure I'm quoting it correctly. But uh, I am concerned with exploring the world as it is. That is consonance. I'm not concerned with exploring distance right now. We, we have never explored consonance. Never. The, the Renaissance people tried to, but immediately uh, Bach came along and destroyed it. I, I don't blame him for destroying it, but he destroyed it in this sense, that he equivocated, or no, it wasn't Bach alone, there was a lot of people, but he, he, he is the guy who put the halo on the head, you see. And, and, and uh, so there was an equivocation between consonance and distance. Consonance was not clear, distance was not, was not clear, because in the piano scale, nothing was consonant, nothing was dissonant. Well, I would think, too, that the sense of consonance comes through not only in the music, but in the theme of the music drama of tonight. Uh, if I'm quoting you correctly, correctly you described it as... Uh, a ritual of dream and delusion. And what else? And also of uh, a reconciliation of life with death and of life yes, with right, life. Right. Uh -huh. right. I, I can't explain that. <laughs> <laughs> would, would, would you explain it in, the, in terms of uh, human consonants? Well, I don't, I'm not sure I know what that means, but I suppose so, yes. Uh, in, in, in the uh, basis of what uh, my understanding with you is concerned, I suppose so. There's also a tremendous amount of humor, in, especially in the last act. Well, you see, this, this, is, uh, this goes back to my, uh, my probably much, much of my interest in the ancient Greek, where, where they did, a, where they did a, a tragedy in the morning and they did a satyr or a satyr play in the afternoon. And, uh, and that's not only Greek. It, I, I've discovered this even in American Indians. They do something very serious and they do something hilarious and probably obscene, as the Greeks did. And, uh, and, and uh, so this time, this time around, I found these two. Oh, when was it? About 1960. I found these two things about the same time. This no play and the, and the uh, African tale, folk tale. And, and 
I thought at the time, wouldn't this be a great combination in one evening to do these two things as a tragedy and, uh, well, whatever you want to call it uh, afterwards. In other words, a, well, what is the word? There's a Greek word to describe this. You know, the cleansing. Um, catharsis. Ca catharsis, right. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I don't come up with the words. That's right. You know, I wouldn't like to get back to uh, your very own music. And when I asked you for your definition of music, perhaps I was asking... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You asked me that. Let, let me tell you what, how I feel about this. I feel that through the concert system, it has gotten a long way away from, from the purpose for music. For example, you've got uh, tuxedos. You know, you, you, no man can appear without a tux. And no, no woman can appear, without, can appear without a heaving bosom and roses. <laughs> and I'm totally against it. I'm just totally against it. If any roses come on the stage tomorrow night, I think I'll leave immediately. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do, you, do you think, uh, for this reason, music has been constricted because the audience, in a way, was constricted? The audience? I, I, I went to something. I won't mention any names. But I went to an audience, uh, it's the last time I attended a concert. It was, uh, oh well, why go into details? Anyway, I attended a concert. And I saw a sea, literally, of gray, of uh, blue-haired ladies. <laughs> okay, if that's what draws concerts, if that's what holds concerts together, I'm totally against it. Well, I was against it when I was 18, you know, so, so this is not new to me. But uh, it was true then. I said at the time, where am I? I'm, I'm five decades ago. Because it hasn't changed at all. And I want to get people like your son here involved. Well, how uh, would you want people to listen to music, to attend a concert? I want to get back to ritual. I don't want them to close their eyes in a dark room. It's ritual. It's ritual. It's ritual. Constantly, unless it's part of ritual, it's not part of life. Now, uh, what have we got in ritual? Uh, we've got death and birth and marriage. And look at it, look at it. It's ghastly, so far as so far as music is concerned. It is totally horrible. Do you think that the musical climate has changed to the point where? Your work, which uh, I at one no, I, I can't answer that. I just cannot uh, predict it. It's ridiculous for me to try to predict. I don't know. There was a time when I thought that uh, that I could change things, but I don't know. No, I have no idea. Well, how do you feel now, at the age of sixty-seven, when you're getting some? very, very fine reviews, and uh, I remember recent ones in the New York Times and the New Yorker magazine, High Fidelity magazine, where your work Excuse is me. accepted. <laughs> well, they aren't the first, actually. They, they have been coming off and on for a long, long time. Well, not, not consistently, but uh, I think uh, the first good review I had was in 1932. How many years is that? 30, uh, six, 37 years ago. Uh, so uh, it isn't sudden, even though it seems to be sudden to, to people who, who don't know, don't know that I've been around. Do you, do you have any particular feeling about that? Uh, is it well, coming? Sure, is sure. It, is I, it? I have a feeling about it. It is too late. It's too late. I, I can't react the way I could have. And I can't react in the sense of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of cooperating. For example, I had an offer of a commission, $2,500, which is very beautiful. But I couldn't fulfill it. It's out of the question. I simply couldn't fulfill it. Well, you've been described as a musical loner. Do you accept that uh, oh, definition? I have to. I have to. There's no other way. Can a composer work 
in a vacuum? Can a musical... It isn't a vacuum. It isn't a vacuum. As long as audiences respond, it is not a vacuum. <laughs> but the audiences are getting bigger and they're responding more. That's right, that's right. But I have less energy to cope with. <laughs> well, do you think you'll ever really stop composing? Not as long as I live, no. Where do you hear these sounds of yours? Where? I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, one experiment leads to another, just like uh, with a scientist, every question, when solved, leads to another question. So I don't, I, I couldn't answer that. Uh, yeah, I, I built the, the built, I built uh, percussion instruments. I kept getting lower and lower and lower. And uh, finally I thought, well, if I ever have a house, I'm gonna have a, a stairway with a huge built-in marimba aroga so that I, I can <laughs> run up the stairs. <laughs> And we'll go up the scale. But uh, you see, I don't know. That, well, okay. <laughs> are, are, there, are there any instruments uh, that you have not constructed that you'd still like to oh, build? Indeed, indeed, indeed. But I can't describe them. Because, because it's, it's very difficult to, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. It, it, in a sense, it's improvisation. If I don't get a good sound in one, I have built the little cathara nine times, rebuilt it. Built and rebuilt it nine times. So I don't know. In order to get better sounds and more, more what I want, more what I want. Mr. Parch, how many instruments are there here that uh, you used in the music drama? I can't even remember. There are um, about 24, I think. Uh, uh, for fairly large to large instruments. And there are about 7,000 pounds of instruments, roughly. And a lot of small instruments, uh, drums and uh, claves and that sort of thing. Now, some instruments have a base of familiarity. This one we're looking at now does look like a xylophone. Well, it's arranged differently. And when you change the pattern, uh, for example, if you change the the, uh, the xylophone pattern, that, that is, the piano keyboard, which has become a kind of a tyrant in music. In fact, it is a tyrant. Why, why do they say a kind of tyrant? It is a tyrant. It's a fantastic tyrant. If you change that pattern just a little bit, which I've done here, then you've got a totally different sound. Well, one final question, Mr. Parch. Who do you write for? Who do you want as your audience? Oh, myself. Myself. But as your audience? That's never been a problem. I've always had great audiences. I don't know. <laughs> You're asking me impossible questions. I've always had great audiences. Well, maybe not always. I was booed off the stage one time. <laughs> <coughs> Did, did you resent this, or just... No, uh, I, I felt sad about it, but I didn't resent it. But it, it wasn't live music. It was, it was a recording. So, when I've had live, live music, I've always had great audiences. Did you ever think in terms of your being an influence on other musicians? I wish I were more, I'll say that because I, I, I don't like the direction music is going. Well, thank you, Harry Parch, his music, his instruments, and a bit of his philosophy. This is Edwin Gordon, VOA, Los Angeles.